chapter number 8. If you brought your Bible with you, if you would turn with me, please, to Luke chapter number 8. If you don't have your Bible, they will be putting it up on the screen. But, but at verse number 22 is where we're going to start. And we see that Jesus and the disciples have gotten into this boat on the water. Crazy stuff always happens when Jesus and the disciples are on water. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff happens when they get in a boat. It's like madness. Like, it never is just like, get in the boat, end up where you're supposed to go. It's like storms come, people jumping out of the boat, like trying to walk to Jesus. Jesus is walking on water. It's craziness. So every time they get in the boat, it seems like something mad happens. But, but in this particular instance, Jesus is on the boat with the disciples, and a storm still comes because just because Jesus is in your life does not mean you don't face any storms. Just because you have Jesus in your heart does not mean that everything is dandelions and rainbows and everything's beautiful all the time. But it says, starting at verse number 22, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. Now, just to be clear, Jesus told them, let us go over to the other side. Jesus told them, and I want to make that very clear because it messes with some of us. We like to think that as long as I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing, as long as I'm obeying Jesus and doing what Jesus has told me to do, then everything is smooth sailing. As long as I'm listening to him, it's smooth sailing. But it says that Jesus told them to get into the boat. You get it? I want to be abundantly clear in that. Jesus said, let us get in the boat and go to the other side. Jesus didn't say, let's stay right here. And then the disciples didn't listen, got in the boat. Because that's understandable. That happens sometimes. But Jesus said, hey, hey, let's you see the boat. Let's get in it. And let's go over to the other side. And they got into the boat and set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a squall came down on the lake. That's like southern twang for a storm. Squall. Just kidding. What it really means is a sudden violent gust of wind or a localized storm with rain. The part I want to look at is that it says it's a sudden violent storm. You ever felt like the storm in your life was sudden? You ever felt like the thing that was going on in your life came out of nowhere? Like completely out of left field, you weren't ready for it, you weren't prepared for it, it just showed up. Squall came so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. And the disciples went and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters and the storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. In other words, Jesus is saying, If you would have had faith, you could have done what I just did. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? Who do you think he is? Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Jesus and the disciples, they get into the boat at Jesus' instruction. Jesus instructed them, let's get into the boat. And then Jesus goes to sleep. And all of a sudden, a storm comes. They're just cruising along. Jesus is like, hey, y'all chauffeur me to the other side. I'm going to go take a nap. And a sudden storm comes. See, we're always praying for suddenlies. Jesus, I need a suddenly in my life. God, give me a suddenly. I need a, su- I need a sudden man. I need a sudden financial increase. I need a sudden bl- I need a suddenly. And then... A storm comes. It's like, no, I'm not talking about that kind of suddenly. I'm talking about the good kind of suddenlies. Maybe I need to be more specific. But but the sudden storm comes, and I say it jokingly, but but isn't that how we sometimes feel, though? Like, Like the storms in our life are sudden. Like the pressure is all of the sudden. It's not something that we're expecting. It's not something that we're wanting in our lives, and it just comes out of nowhere. And it's like... Jesus, could I have at least had a heads up? Could you have at least let me know something crazy was about to happen? Could you have said, you know, hey, we're getting in this boat to go to the other side, but spoiler alert, we ain't going straight to the other side. You're going to freak out for a minute because things are going to get crazy. Then I'm prepared. 
then I'm ready. But no, all we have is a word from Jesus that says, let's go over to the other side. So that's what I'm expecting. But then I get this storm, and it's like if I could have at least been prepared, if I could have at least known that something was going to happen, that it wasn't going to be the way that I wanted it to be. But it's like it's sudden pressure, right? This sudden storm just comes out of nowhere. I'm talking to somebody today who feels as if you are going under. Talking to somebody today who feels maybe as if you are already under with the pressure that you're facing and the things that you were not expecting and the sudden death in your family that you didn't know was going to take place and the sudden lost job that you didn't know was going to happen and you weren't preparing for and the sudden problem in your marriage that nobody taught you about in premarital counseling. The sudden things in your life, some pressure where when it comes you feel like you're going under. Or maybe you're already there. So today, for this last week of Under Pressure, I want to talk to you on the subject, over, not under. Amen. Over, not under. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today, and I thank you that we have the opportunity to come before you today and to, to learn from you, to hear from you. And I pray that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts and our lives, and, and that you would help us to take what is spoken and what we experience in our worship together today and apply it to our lives so that we may begin to see change. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now, have you ever noticed this? Have you ever noticed how, if you're in a relationship, that you can notice and see that somebody else is trying to hit on your person before they ever realize it? You ever notice that? Like, and vice versa. Like, like, they can tell somebody's flirting with you before you can realize it. It's very uptight in here right now. Y'all need to relax. It is Sunday morning. It is okay. Things are all good. It's like, I, I don't know what he's talking about. I've never known. No, so, like, you notice this. Like, you can see it from a distance better than the person can that's, like, going through it, right? Like, we've experienced this. We've seen. And, and the crazy thing is, like, in today's time, it doesn't even have to be in person. With social media now, we can see some, like, we can see it on the computer when somebody's trying to step in on the person that we're dating, that we're in a relationship with. We see it. We see it because especially if it's like you got a good thing, right? Like me, I got a great thing. So I'm watchful, right? The Bible says you got to watch and pray. So I'm praying, but I'm like praying with one eye open, right? Like I'm watchful. I'm checking out what's going on. I'm, I'm, I'm watching. I'm paying attention because I'm nice. I'm calm. I'm laid back. I'm cool. I'm collective. But let me catch somebody trying to slide over to my wife. I will cut you. I will go from Jesus to Peter in like an instant, like just out of nowhere. Let me catch, and I learned this from my dad. I did. I learned it from my dad. Because when I was younger, I watched dad one time back a guy that was messing with mom up to a wall with his finger. Just like this. Am I lying? Just like this. Just backed him up. The guy goes, oh, you're that kind of preacher. Yep. A savage. Savage dad. But, I mean, the truth is, like, if you can't shepherd and protect your family, how can you shepherd and protect a church? So, so I saw this, and so that, that's kind of the mindset that I take. I'm like, listen, I'm, this is my family. I'm going to shepherd and protect my family. I will cut you. Just saying. But a couple months ago, I'm scrolling through these pictures that Nicole had posted on Facebook of her, me, and Judah. Nicole is my wife, if it's your first time here today. And, and so, and Judah's our son. He's a handful. But anyways, so I'm scrolling through these pictures, and I see that, that Nicole's posted pictures of me, her, and Judah all throughout this album. And this guy had liked every picture that I wasn't in. It's okay. I'm going to stay, stay calm, man. I'm staying calm, right? I'm a pastor. I stay calm. Like, okay, it's a coincidence. It's a coincidence. The only pictures came up in his feed, right? A couple weeks later, I noticed that he's tagged her in this post, and he says, hey, I just bought the same dog that you have. We should get the dogs together sometime. <laughs> I, I, I pick up my phone. I'm like, 
calling all my friends, like, hey, man, you busy? You busy? Like, we might need to ride somewhere. Right? Like, how are you, because some of them in ministry, how are you with hospital visits? Because I'm about to put somebody there, like, right now. Like, I need to know. I'm kind of kidding a little bit, kind of. And, and so I'm like, I told Nicole, I was like, babe, listen, I love you, and I trust you 100%. I do, with my, I, I 100%. But this guy's bad news. He's bad news. I don't trust him as far, I don't, as far as I can throw a feather, which isn't very far. I don't trust him at all. I don't, I don't trust it. I trust you. And she's laughing. She's like, oh, yeah, I know. I don't, I don't think, you know, it's just he doesn't mean anything by it. And I'm like, oh, oh, no. No, he means something by it. Because trust me, I'm crazy a little bit. I went back to see, did he like the pictures I was in or are we still on the train where we only like pictures that her husband is not in, right? And so I go, and so I'm like, okay, okay, it's fine. You, I mean, you tell me it's cool, I, I believe you. But then a couple days later, she, comes, she calls me on her way home. She's like, okay, you might have been right. <laughs> might have been right. And this dude had given her a gift and said, I just saw this and it made me think of you. What? Oh, I can't preach this Sunday. The things that just went through my mind, I can't preach this Sunday. Ain't happening. I was like, okay, well, listen, we got to, our trash can is outside in the garage. So on your way into our house, you can throw it in the trash. Because the only man who provides gifts for you in this household is me. Is me, you know. But see, she, she was completely oblivious for the longest time. She didn't even see it. But I recognized the threat. I recognized the threat. See, man, y'all know. Y'all know. Some of y'all women, too. Y'all like, you don't even have to. You can just tell. It's like you can just see by the way that a woman looks at your husband, and it's like, no, honey. No, no, we don't do that look. That's the look I got him with. You don't do that to him, right? That's how I got him. But we know. Like, you, you, you can see it, but she was completely, she couldn't see it. She didn't realize it or understand it. But I had recognized the threat, and I wasn't going to ignore it. I wasn't going to deny it. I was going to talk about it and go after it. Because I recognize the threat. See, the first thing I need you to see today is you got to recognize the threat. In your life, you got to recognize the threat. It said in verse number 22, or 23, it said, As they sailed, Jesus fell asleep, and a squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. They were in great danger. And the disciples recognized it because they said, Master, Master. We're going to die. We're going to drown. They recognized the threat. It does not say that everything was okay. It says they were in great danger. And the disciples recognized the threat. They recognized the danger. They were not overreacting. They were not making things up. They were not trying to put things there that were not really there. The Bible says they were in danger. Not only that, they were in great danger. And they recognized it, and then they acknowledged it, and they went to the one Jesus who they knew would do something about it. Amen. They said, no, no, we see that there is a threat, so we're going to go to the one who has the answer. We're going to go to Jesus. They did not ignore the threat. So this is what we do a lot of times. We, we like to ignore it. We like to pretend that it does not exist. That everything is okay when it's not okay. And if I just act like it's not there, then eventually it won't be there anymore. You're kind of right. It won't be there. It'll just be worse. It won't be where it was. It'll be worse. But we like to be like, you know what? It's okay. I'm just going to pretend that it doesn't exist. Because this is what we think we're supposed to do. Especially in church. Like, like I just got to act like I have it all together. I got to pretend that everything is okay. This is, why, this is why marriages among like ministers do not always last the best because they feel like they have to always act like it's okay. 
This is why people come into church broken and they never tell anybody and they leave broken and they stay broken for 10, 20, 30 years because they have to act like everything is okay. And I need you to know that Elevation Point Church, here my heart, is not a place where you got to act like it's okay. It's a place where you can come and say, I'm not okay and I need some help in this thing. Because it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. But when we ignore it and we try to pretend like everything's perfect, then it only gets worse. But we come in and we're like, no, I've got it all together. I'm just ignoring it. It's, everything's fine. But the reality is we all got issues. We all got issues. All of us. If today is your first time in church ever, you got issues. But if today is your 30th day in church, you've got issues. If you've been in church for 30 years, you've got issues. My name is Dustin, and I've got issues. My name is Pastor Dustin, and I still got issues. See how I put the title there, but I still got issues? There's a song on the radio that y'all probably never heard before because it doesn't come on 104.7 The Fish and Praise 102.5. So I know that you've never, I know those are the only two stations that y'all listen to on a weekly basis. But there's a song, and it says, I've got issues, you've got them too. And I'm like, you preach that. Preach that. I don't know what they're, I'm not singing the rest of the song. I don't know the lyrics to the rest of the song. I'm not endorsing the song. But that phrase right there, I've got issues, you've got them too. It's so true. It's so true. Just because you're ignoring the issues in your life does not mean you don't have any. Just because you ignore it doesn't mean that it's not there. Some, I want you to repeat this after me. I, I have, have issues. issues. Isn't that so free? It's like... The pressure is gone because, church, it is not healthy to try to pretend like everything is okay. It is not healthy to act like you have no issues and like everything is perfect and like everything's roses and, and rainbows. And, and I, don't, I go to church just to worship, but I don't really need the word. I don't need what's being said. I go to church just because I know I need to, but not because I need to hear what's said. I don't go because I need the community. I've got people in my life. I don't have issues. I'm good. Everything's perfect. No, we got issues. And it is unhealthy to pretend and act like you don't have any. Like everything is okay. Like everything is perfect all the time. And there's never any problems in your life. You got to come to the point where you say, you know what? There's some things in my life that are not where they should be. There's some things in my life that I'm not, I'm not okay with how they are. Things are decent in my life, but this situation, I need to see some change. In my child's life, I need to see some change. In my job, I need to see some change. In my spouse, I need to see some change. I need to see some things go a little bit different than the way that they've been. We got to get to the point where we come in and we're just acknowledging the reality that there are some issues in our lives. Say one more time. I got issues. I've got issues. The disciples, they didn't ignore it. They didn't ignore it. They, they, they acknowledged it. See, we come into church acting all dignified. Button my shirt up to the top. I'm all dignified, right? Everything's okay. We come into church and we're smiling. But the truth is the only time we smile is on Sunday when we put the fake one on to come to church. We come in and we look nice, we're dressed nice, right? We look great, but we got three pairs of Spanx on so that we feel good about ourselves because the pressure, talk about pressure sometimes in them Spanx. Anyways, pressure, I don't even know where to go from here, honestly. But it's, it's pressure, right? So we come in and we're smiling, but that's the only time with the fake smile because throughout the week we have too much pressure. We have too much pressure. Come in looking all nice, got three pairs of Spanx on, but, but it's the pressure of caring what everybody else thinks about us. It's the pressure of wanting to look a specific way because we think that's the only way that anybody will accept us. See, for some of us, the, the greatest pressure that we have on our lives right now is trying to keep up the act that we've been putting on. 
Some of us, the greatest pressure is trying to keep up. How long can I fool everybody else into thinking that I'm okay? How long can I fool everybody else into thinking that it's all good? It's all gravy, baby. It's all good in my life. I'm looking good today. I'm smiling. I'm kicking on all cylinders. But the truth is, I don't even want to go home. How long can I keep that? See, the the greatest pressure in some of our lives is not the pressure that other people are putting on us. It's the pressure that we're putting on ourselves. And we're putting all this pressure and all these things. Well, I'm just walking by faith. No. No. Faith is not denial. Faith is not ignorance. Faith is acknowledgement. Faith is acknowledging that there is a problem, but Jesus is greater. There's a problem there, but Jesus is greater. That's faith. Faith is being able to look at it, to own it. That is an issue. That is a problem. But Jesus is greater than that problem. That's what faith is. It's not ignoring it. It's not denying it. Faith is not saying that that there's no problems in my life. Faith is saying, yeah, that is a problem, but it's okay because Jesus is greater. Yeah, I don't like the way that thing is in my life and that thing I've been struggling with. It shouldn't be that way. It should be better. But it's okay because Jesus is greater. Yeah, this is a struggle that we've been dealing with. But it's okay because Jesus is greater. It does not say that the disciples looked at the squall and the storm and said, I don't see a storm. You see a storm? No, I don't see one either. They, they, they didn't look at this, this wind that was coming and, and the rain that was coming and the, the boat is being overrun. They didn't look at all this stuff that's just funneling in and just turn a blind eye. They didn't look at it and say, y'all want to go take a nap? Y'all want to go relax? I'm, I'm sure this thing, yeah, it looks like it's something, but it's, I'm, I feel like maybe if we ignore it a little while, maybe we just kind of pretend that it's not there. Like if we just don't deal with it, some of the greatest problems in our lives is we will not deal with our issues. If I just don't deal with it, then it'll just go away. No, no, no. The disciples, they looked at the storm and they said, Master, Jesus, we got an issue. We've got a problem. How can Jesus ever heal the problems in your life? If you will not admit that you have them. How can Jesus bring healing? See, for some of us, there is so much healing that Jesus wants to bring into our life, but he can't do it because we won't admit that it's there. There's so many things that God wants to do in our lives, but we won't admit it because we think that that as long as I don't admit it, maybe it's not really there. And for some of us, we've been keeping up the act so long that we're, the biggest pressure is we're ashamed of what people are going to think when they find out we've been lying to them. What do I do when I tell the person that, that, that I've been friends with in church for three months that I have an addiction issue? Well, what's going to happen when, when they find out That even though I tell them everything's great at home, every Sunday I come, I'm like, I I, I just got, got, I got, I got to have enough poured in me this Sunday morning so that I can make it back for the week. What's going to happen when I start to allow people to see that I'm not okay? And let me be completely 100% transparent and honest. Church, if we're going to preach and we are because this, I'm convicted of this. I am convicted that the church for too long has been a place that only healed people could be at. I'm convicted that for too long the church is a place where if you came in with scars and with issues, not only scars from past things, I'm talking about scars from last week that you were shunned or that you were told that it wasn't okay. I am tired of the church being a place where you can only come if everything in your life looks okay. So we're going to preach it because we believe it. But if we're going to preach it, then we have to be willing to welcome them. 
We have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm willing to get dirty with you. I'm gonna, I know I look great in my outfit, but I'm willing to roll back my sleeves. I'm willing to work through this thing with you. How long do we need to stay and pray after church? I know the service is over, but let's just stay and pray a little while. Let's just pray this thing through because I still believe that there's power in a God and in a Holy Spirit that can bring change to things that you carried in on a Sunday morning. It doesn't have to be there on Sunday night. But we can't pray through stuff if you don't admit there's something to pray through. If we're going to preach this, we got to live it. And for some of us to live it, the first thing we got to do at the end of this service when we have an altar time is we got to run down here and say, I don't care who's around me. I don't care who's looking at me. But I've got to get down and get healing in my life so that I can bring healing to other people's life. Don't you realize that Jesus brought healing to others so that they could then continue to move and to be the hands and feet? But we can't be the hands and feet of Jesus when we don't allow healing to take place in our own lives. And we're keeping up the look and the appeal. But the disciples, they said, no, no, no. They acknowledged that there's an issue. They said, Jesus, we've got an an, an issue. We've got a problem. We've got something that we're facing that we don't know how to handle. Because that's the only way that Jesus can bring healing to it. Is when you acknowledge that. My greatest concern with this series has been that some of us think that that I'm trying to say that we need to ignore the pressure. Never saying we need to ignore the pressure. I'm not saying that we need to pretend that the pressure does not exist. I'm saying we need to acknowledge the pressure while simultaneously acknowledging that Jesus is greater. Acknowledge the threat. Recognize the threat that's in your life. Some of us, it's an addiction. Some of us, it's unforgiveness. Some of it's bitterness. We have all these different things. Some of us, it's greed. But we have these threats in our lives. Recognize the threat while simultaneously recognizing that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. My question to you is, is are you allowing the fear of what you're facing to go higher than your faith in God? And if you're not willing to confront it because you think it's going to overtake you, then that answers the question. Faith is being able to say, you know what? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ignoring this. I'm not, I'm not putting this under the rug anymore. I'm bringing it out because I know that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Are we allowing the, the pressure that we're facing to take our focus from the promise that Jesus made? So you've got to recognize the threat. Then you've got to respond to it. See, it's, it's one thing to recognize the threat, but then you have to respond to it. It said that the disciples in verse 24 went and woke Jesus up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all was calm. The disciples recognized the threat. They said, Master, Master, we're going to drown. That's the threat. But then Jesus responded to the threat. But notice, Jesus told the disciples, you could have done the same thing I just did. You could have, you could have responded yourself. We got to learn to respond. Jesus looked at the winds and waves, and he rebuked them. Now, this is important. And write this down. If you're not taking notes or anything, please write this down at least. Type in your phone something. You cannot rebuke a devil that you continuously grant access to. See, Jesus has given us power to rebuke things. He's given us power. He said, yo, disciples, y'all could have rebuked this wind and waves. You could have rebuked it. But the disciples allowed access. So it stayed. You cannot rebuke it. Jesus has given us power to rebuke all kinds of things. Anxiety, fear, depression, worry, unforgiveness, bitterness. Temptation, he's given us the power to rebuke these things. But you cannot rebuke what you're granting access. I'll say it like this. You cannot rebuke a consequence. See, choices have consequences. Every choice that we make has consequences. Every decision that we make has consequences. And you cannot rebuke a consequence. You cannot, if, you're, if you 
make the decision to grant access to something in your life that you know you should not grant access to, consequences are going to come. And a lot of us are making decisions that we know we should not make and then trying to rebuke the consequence. Just say, no, no, you got to rebuke it before it ever gets to you. Stop granting access. Stop allowing things into your life that have no place there. Stop allowing the things to set up residence that should not be there. If, if you've been responding to the threat, if you've been responding and, and saying things, and it's still continuing to show up, it's time to stop allowing it. It's time to stop allowing it. It's time to get mad enough and tired enough to say, I'm going to do something about it. I am tired of dealing with this. I'm not allowing access anymore, but it's time. It is time to tell that thing to get out of my family, to get out of my children, to get out of my household, to get out of, of, of my mind, to get out. It's time to get our sanity back. It's time to get our household back. It's time to get our peace back. It's time to rebuke the things that have been holding us back from experiencing what God has for our lives. It's time. It's time to say, you have no right, no right coming against my household. You have no right coming against my career. You have no right coming against my health. And you have to go. You got to respond to it. But you can't rebuke it if it continues to grant access. We say we're rebuking it, but then we slide open the back door. When nobody's looking, nobody's looking, nobody's looking. So we're rebuking it in church, but we're allowing it during the week. We're, we're, we're rebuking it in church, but then on a Tuesday night when we're weak and we're tired and we're stressed out, just open the door back up and it just slips back in. But you can't rebuke it if you're continuously granting access to it. We've got to learn to, to stand up and to say, you know what? I'm responding to this thing right now. I'm responding to it. Jesus said you had the power to rebuke the storm. You had the power to rebuke it. So we've got to learn to respond, to rebuke the things that are trying to come into our lives that have no business being in our lives. But the last thing I need you to see is that you've got to use the word. You got to use the word. How do I respond? What do I respond with? You got to use the word. It said in verse 23, the pressure came. It said, as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep and a squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. A squall came in verse 23 and they were in great danger. See, this is when the pressure came. In verse number 23, the pressure. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, like pressure. Some of y'all know. You've been through some pressure. And the pressure came, and it said they were in great danger. Now, when you read it in verse 23 by itself, it makes sense why the disciples were freaked out. Because the verse 23, the, the, the pressure came, and the disciples freak out. And when that's all that you read, verse 23... And uh, you understand it. If I'm on a boat and it starts getting bombarded with water, <laughs> whew, no thank you. I'm going to be freaking out. I'm going to be stressed out. There's wind, there's water, there's rain, all these things. When you read verse 23 by itself, it makes sense why the disciples were a little uneasy. It makes sense why they were freaking out. When you look at that portion of your life, I don't know what it is for you, but whatever your verse 23 is, whatever the thing in your life that's just been bringing the pressure, been bringing the thunder, man. I mean, like there's no way around it. When you look at that section of your life by itself, you can understand, I can understand why you're freaking out and why you're stressing out. But I got one more verse to read for you real quick. Is that okay? I'll get you out to brunch in a second, I promise. But listen to this. Back up at verse number 22. See, verse 22 comes before 23. Math is not my strongest subject, but that much I know. 22 comes before 23. And it said, one day, Jesus said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. Y'all don't, you, you don't see it still? It's okay, I'm gonna break it down for you because that's what I like to do. 
So in verse 23, the pressure came. The storm came. They were going to drown. They were going under. The boat was being rocked back and forth. That's when the pressure came. But Jesus had already given them the answer to the pressure before the storm ever even came. Because in verse 22, he said, let us go over to the other side. Jesus never would have told them we're going over to the other side if they were going under. Jesus never would have told you that you were going to the other side if you were going under. Come on, somebody. Jesus never would have said, let us go over to the other side if they were going to go under in the storm. The problem is that the pressure came after Jesus gave the word. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. So stop letting the enemy fill your minds with thoughts of going under. Because Jesus has already spoken the ending into existence. See, Jesus transcends time. He's with you before the storm. He's with you in the storm. But he's already gone to the other side. So if he said we're going to the other side, guess what? We're going to the other side. If Jesus said it, it's going to happen. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. But the problem is, he said it before the pressure ever even came. And we're asking God for a word. We're crying out. We're praying for a word that Jesus already gave. We're in the storm. And Jesus already gave it. See, the problem is, we're praying for a word in the middle of the storm because we think we need something new because this took God by surprise. But Jesus said, no, I already gave you the word. So you got to start living the word that Jesus already gave you. You got to start living the word that he already spoke in your life. See, a lot of us know a lot of scriptures and that's so good, but we're not living them. We know the Bible, but we're not living them. And some of us have been followers of Jesus for 30 years and we're seeing new followers of Jesus that just accepted Christ a month ago, seeing amazing things. And it's like, I don't get how they're seeing all that because they still have the awe where they're reading God's word and when they read it, they do it. When they read it, they they actually say, "I, I gotta do this. I'm not above this. I need to pray. I need to read my word. I need to be ministering to other people. I need to tell other people about Jesus. They're reading God's word and they're still doing it. A lot of us know the word, but we're not living it. It's not about how much scripture that you know. It's about how much scripture that you live. And so what happens is we know the word. We know it all. We can say it. Like you could stand here and you could recite it. But then you get into the middle of the storm and everything you've already read goes out your brain. Goes out of your mind. You completely forget about it. And we start praying and we're like, Jesus, I need a word. I need a word. But Jesus already gave it. And he's saying, live the word that I've already given you. Sickness has struck my body. I don't know what to do. God, I need a word to know that it's going to be okay. By my stripes, you are healed. God, I'm under so much pressure at work and I got pressure on my job with with all these things and with my family and with my children and and, and I'm trying to figure all this out and financially we're not doing well and, and I feel like I'm being just, I'm done, God. I'm under so much pressure. I feel like I'm done. But God said that you are pressed but not crushed. You're persecuted. You're not abandoned. You're struck down but you are not destroyed. Jesus, but I just don't know. I don't know, Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm facing this situation, and it seems like the enemy's attacking me on the left, the right, the back, everywhere. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle it. I don't have the strength to overcome this. I need a word. And he says, you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I can't do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, we say that, but we don't live it. We say it. But then we get in the storm and we forget. But if somebody else is going through a storm, hey, you just, Philippians 4.13, don't forget it. But then we're in our own storm and we're on our knees and we're crying out to God. 
And he's like, I gave you the answer in my word, but you got to start living it. Jesus, you know, I've only, I've only been a follower, Jesus, for like three months. And, and I'm just, I'm a mess. And I don't know, like I'm still struggling with some things I struggled in before I started following Jesus. And I'm facing some things and I don't know how to handle it. And I, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel good enough to be able to serve. I don't feel good enough to be able to come before him and pray. I don't feel good enough to do anything. But guess what? You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I've got an answer for everything that you want to throw my way. Anything that the enemy's been telling you, I've got an answer in my word. But you got to start to speak it. You got to start to live it. When the enemy starts coming against you, it's not, a, it's not one thing to be praying and asking God for an answer, but it's another thing to start living the answer that he's already given. God said, I gave you my word. But you got to use it. You got to use the word that I've already given you. Would you stand?